So I don't know how much of this we're going to get through. I'm going to call on you uh, to read scriptures tonight. And uh, we're just going to have a little bit of time of digging in the Word of God. As we dig in the Word of God, we're going to dig deep in our heart and plant it so that uh, the Lord can uh, show a harvest of His Word in our life. But I want to look at a call to worship. A call to worship. Someone read for me John chapter number 4, verse number 23 and 24. I'm not going to do all the reading. I want you to participate. You be a part of this tonight. And uh, even if you don't know the words, if you're reading straight from the paper or you read from the Bible, we'll get there. Someone read John 4, 23 and 24. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And they that worship him must worship him what? In spirit and in truth, the word of God says. Just turn my Bible for one second. Must worship him in spirit and in truth. And this is who's he speaking to? The woman at the well. He's telling her about salvation. He's telling her about true worship. Those that worship him will need to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Knowing that God is a spirit. Not through rituals and uh, not through ceremonies, uh, but he said there's a different type of worship. And that is in spirit, who you are, and in truth. What God was revealing. Amen. So those two words, spirit and truth there. There's a lot of emphasis on worship. The word is worship, the blank. There's a lot of emphasis on worship in the church world today. We hear the phrase praise and worship mentioned frequently. Pentecostals have always been known as portraying their worship in a demonstrative fashion, while other denominations worship in a quieter way. Uh, now we hear praise and worship being performed in all denominations with uplifted hands swaying and moving around. How much of it is true, true, T-R-U-E, true worship? What is worship? How are we to worship? So we're going to look at that tonight. What is true worship? And how are we to worship? It's probably going to be much different than what most of us think. Because I'm not going down the direction that maybe some of you already have uh, in your mind. We're going to talk about what the Word of God says about true worship. What is it? I love it. It's a, it's a good reminder to us. Webster's Dictionary defines worship in the noun form as a reverence or a devotion for a deity. A veneration or an act of showing deep feeling, respect, and reverence. Intense love or admiration of any kind. Let's read on. Worship, when used in the verb form, means number one, to show religious reverence for, and number two, to have, and the blank is, to have intense love or admiration for. To have intense love or admiration for. Every one of us probably in here uh, very early on learned to have an intense love for something. Now as we grow mature, our intensity changes a bit. But uh, 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 we, we probably all can relate to something that we intensely love. Someone, something, uh, some activity, uh, we, we can relate to that. And so, uh, let's read on. I think it's safe to say to declare that, that we who are involved in praise and worship have a reverence and a respect for God, our almighty creator. We have an intense love and admiration for him. But listen to this. But do we really, do we really, R-E-A-L-L-Y, do we really worship him in spirit and truth in spirit 
and in truth. Are we really devoted to him? Are we devoted to obeying his words and his will? So I want to read Ecclesiastes 12.10. Ecclesiastes 12.10. Even words of truth. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. And that which was written was upright, even words of truth. So if we worship God, we worship Him in spirit and in truth. We worship Him through the Word of God. Through the Word of God. If we claim to be a believer... I believe that there can be some folks that start out right, but we have to have direction in doing it right. Anyone who's going to become skilled or crafted or the best at something has to have direction. You know, you have someone to mentor you. You have someone who you're, you're an apprentice to. Uh, you have someone who shows you. You take schooling because you want to become good. How do we become a good worshiper? The best way to become a good worshiper and a godly worshiper and a true worshiper is to know the truth of God's word. There should be a hungering and a thirsting for righteousness. There should be a daily walk in the word of God. With Adam and Eve, it was a verbalization of walking with God in the Garden of Eden, and they heard the word of God. Throughout the Old Testament, God worked at diverse times and in sundry places by having prophets who would share glimpses of God's word. They would have a word that was relevant for the day. Not only, you know, let me just say this. Uh, who was it was talking? I don't think it was Brother Craig and Brother David and I was talking last Sunday night. You know, uh, in some churches, everyone wants to be a prophet. Prophet so-and-so, prophet so-and-so. You know, if you look at the prophets in the word of God, you know, they were not the most popular. They were not the most well-liked people. They were not the people who was most often given platform or treated with royalty. In fact, it was quite the opposite. So being a real prophet, maybe uh, when you look at the word of God, Brother Doug, may not be what everybody has in mind for being. Everybody wants to have a good word and an encouraging word. But not every prophetic word is going to be what someone wants to hear. It's a word of warning. It's a word of being who and what God wants you to be. And so uh, the Word of God says uh, that the preacher uh, saw even words of truth. So uh, for us, it's hearing the Word of truth from God's Word. There are no end to study books that are available. Our generation has done more studying collectively than any other generation. The flesh gets tired of study, but with all of our resources and with all of our knowledge, the bottom line is still this. Would someone read there uh, 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 Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, and with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. All right, I'm going to give you these words. We'll talk about this for a moment then. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep, K-E-E-P, His commandments, for this is the whole duty, D-U-T-Y, the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, J-U-D-G-E-M-T, with every secret thing, whether it be good, good, or whether it be evil. We have the greatest resource book ever written, but do we really rely on the Word of God as our main source? So here it is in Ecclesiastes. It's the Word of God challenges us to fear God and to keep His commandments. What are the commandments? Is it just found in Exodus? Ten of them? But is that the commandments? The commandments of God, but the whole word of God, right, commands us, right? So the commandments of God's word, that's correct, brother. If we really love God, how do we know God? I don't want to get ahead of myself, but how do we know God? It's through his word. And so if we want to worship him, 
Real worship comes from truth. And real truth comes from the Word of God. And it is our duty or our responsibility. Now, some people may shirk and say, duty, that sounds like responsibility. That sounds like work. That sounds like uh, having to put forth effort. Well, of course, life is a duty, and it's going to be an effort to please and to worship God. Everything that we do in life is going to be a duty. How many of you find that your life runs better by schedule? Me, I do. I mean, it's better if I set an alarm clock and plan out and, you know, not just fly by the seat of my pants. You know, uh, most of us have a, a schedule. You know, schedules don't work. But schedules bring normality. It brings productivity. And it really does bring peace to our lives. And, and whatever area of our life that's on. And so if we are going to be productive in our worship life, there's a duty to the Word of God that we've got to have and to the commandments of God. And that we've got to know that one day, because we worship God, we allow God in every area of our life, and there's no secret places where God is not worshipped. So when we stand before God, we will be judged even in the secret places of our life. And it will be honorable before God. So we'll be judged whether we do good or whether we do evil. I would rather worship God and let my life be good in every area because I'm going to be judged by that. That's real worship. And we have the greatest resource and all the knowledge that we have and all the books. And I have to tell you, even when it comes to uh, life and preparing for church, um, the Internet has just revolutionized my life. I mean, we can have all kinds of information at our fingertips. It's not just books, but resources that we can have that are unlimited at our fingertips. My, 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 if you want to know how to do something, just pull up a YouTube video. They'll walk you through. I mean, we're, our, our world is full of resources. But we have the greatest resource by which we're going to be judged, and that is the Word of God. And we've got to get in it. And we've got to know it. And we've got to live by it because it is our standard of worship. Let me read on. Is, is praise and worship something we only do at church? We sing a few songs. We lift our hands in adoration. Say a few nice things to God like, I love you. I praise you. Hallelujah. We are sincere. We are sincere. We are sincere. We honestly, we honestly, we honestly do love God, but we leave our worship at church. Worship isn't we love the church. No. What's that? No. That's right, I'm getting there, brother. But a lot of people think that worship is just something we do at church. Yeah. Raising hands, singing, maybe swaying. Maybe if you're we'll talk about that a little bit. But worship, church is not the only place we are to worship God. The very foundation of our worship is in our relationship with God. To worship in spirit and in truth is to have a lifestyle. A lifestyle. A lifestyle that is pleasing to God. Worship tonight is about our lifestyle. Everything about us, our lifestyle. That is pleasing to God. They that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. So everything about our lifestyle needs to be pleasing to God because it's worship. We get so busy doing, doing things for God. We get so busy doing things for God that we miss or leave out our relationship with God. I'll be transparent and tell you that this is something that I've had to learn. That it's not about my doing for God. But it's about my relationship with God. And sometimes it may have to eliminate some doing so that I can 
about is build my relationship with God. It's about being temperate or balanced in things. Some call it devotion, spending time in prayer and reading God's Word. But God wants fellowship with us. God wants fellowship with us. Would someone read Jeremiah 29, verse 11 through 14? Second blank is all your heart. All your heart. We often hear folks read the first part of this in Jeremiah that God knows the thoughts that he has toward us. Thoughts of peace and not of, of evil to give us an expected end. We often have to look at preceding and verses that go beyond the verse that we're looking at be able to get the best context of what God is saying. And certainly God does uh, have a plan for us. And his thoughts toward us are good and he wants to give us an expected end. But there is some responsibility on our part. And that responsibility is that when you shall call upon me, you shall go and pray. You know, prayer is a lifestyle and prayer is worship because it's allowing our life to give God the glory that he wants. And the Word of God says that when we search for me with all our heart. Did you ever have a conversation with someone and maybe they're on their cell phone or maybe they're texting or maybe they're reading something or maybe they're distracted with an activity and you're trying to talk and you realize that they're really not giving you their, your full attention. They might be saying, yeah, but, it, but, but you know that they're not grasping the concept of what you're sharing with them. Oftentimes, we're that way with God. We're busy about our own agenda, but we tell God what we need and what we want. We really don't seek Him with our whole heart. And so, God requires something. Worship is seeking Him with our whole heart, not being distracted. And sometimes we have to take away those things in our life that are a distraction, and we have to clear out the clutter of our heart. Now, I'm finding my wife has this little thing that less is more. I'm finding that when we get rid of clutter, we actually feel a lot better in our life, or I do. And uh, so, you know, and it, but it's always spiritually. When we get rid of everything else that's kind of cluttering or in the way or distracting, when we really get to the place where we're seeking God, because seeking God is worship, and wanting our life to fulfill His will is really worship. Because they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And God wants all of us. So if we want the blessings of God and the expected end, we, we will only get that when we pray to Him and we seek Him with all of our heart. Let's read on. There is a price. We must seek Him with all, all our heart. Our heart is the core of us. In the Hebrew, this form of heart means our mind, our will, our will, our feelings, our understanding, our intellect. So our mind, our will, our feelings, our understanding, our intellect. In verse 13, when it says, searching for me with all your heart, it is telling us to search within all of our mind. And with everything, with everything that is within us. So we, we have to search for him with the very core of our being. Have you ever ached from within inside? 
you know, that our desire or want it. That's what God wants when we approach Him and we worship Him and we seek Him. He wants that to be the very core of who we are. You know, when Jesus prayed that prayer, not my will but thine be done, that's a very difficult prayer. How many of you, don't raise your hand, how many of you can steadfastly and confidently say, tonight that you are at that place 100% that it's not my will but it's thy God because God wants us to be there not where it's what we want there are desires of our life and oftentimes in, in a world that, that, that a church preaches that when we ask of God that we will have of God not everything that we ask of God we will have of God the, the, the context of prayer is getting ourselves where we're in the place with God, where we are surrendered and we're moldable and we're pliable and we're, we're allowing God to do and have anything that he wants in our life. God, not my will, but thine be done. Do you think Jesus wanted to go into Gethsemane when he prayed that? Uh, Gethsemane moments. I believe that we need to have them in our life. Where there is a real wrestling. Uh, someday, Hannah, as you get older, you're going to understand the real wrestling. So much that he sweat, and it was intense that he, he there was blood in his sweat. Now, scientists and, 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 and medical folks have said that that is the most intense place that a person can be when there is actually found blood within their perspiration. But Jesus was in that place uh, uh, mentally, emotionally, uh, physically, where he wanted God's will more than his own. And it broke vessels and he sweat blood in his perspiration. Where we get where it's not what we want. We have a will and our will can be strong at times. We can look at others and, and we can say, boy, they're strong will. They're stubborn. We can all be that way. Some of us can cover it up better than others. But God knows, and God wants our will to be surrendered to His will. Not what I want, God, but your will. That is a great place to be in. Because the enemy would like to bring in fear that you'll be alone, that you won't have resources to make it, that it's less than prosperity a prosperous place than what you are now. But we have to get where we are surrendered to the will of God more than we're influenced by the fear and the anxiety that the enemy would want to get. Because God doesn't give a spirit of fear. In Ezekiel 44, verse 10 through 14, some of the priests had begun to work to have begun to worship idols along with worshiping God. So there was a blending, there was a compromise. They were worshiping idols uh, uh, while they were worshiping God. They still did their duties and ministered to the people, but they were continuing to worship idols. God was not pleased. He took their ministry away from them. He took their ministry away from them. What does Exodus 20, verse number 3 say? Does anyone know? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let me read on and then I'll talk. God does not want idols, I-D-O-L-S, God does not want idols in our lives. An idol can be anything that we put ahead of God. What are your, what are your plans, your dreams, your goals, your desires? Will you have to compromise your relationship with God to pursue any of these? It's not worth it. Someone read Psalms 81, verse uh, 9 through 12. Well. 
Bible says, but my people would not, that's the, that's the blank, would not. The next blank is, I gave them up. We bend God's will to conform to ours. We bend God's will to conform to ours. We get our own way and think that we are okay because we get by with it. But at what cost? I won't read this next phrase, but I'll just share. I preached about it the uh, week before last, Sunday before last, where Moses said, God, if you don't go, I'm not going to go. Oftentimes, we in our lives believe that we're worshipers, but real worshipers are surrendered to the will and plan of God. Here it was that priests were compromising their worship with idols and the worship of the real God. And God said, it's not going to be. The Word of God says in Psalms that Israel wouldn't hearken to his, their voice, so he gave them over to their own lust. Sometimes folks think in their life, Sister God, I've lived long enough and I've seen, I've been around long enough that some folks say, well, it must be God's will. No, it wasn't God's will, but God gave you what you want. And it may cost you more than what you want to pay because you tried to bend, you tried to twist, you tried to compromise the will of God to get what you wanted. You may be even, I've seen folks take scripture to get what they want. It's amazing what folks can look at scripture and say and say, but this is the way it is and God, God, so, no, you want Scripture to say that. But God's will will always, will always conform to Scripture. So we have the best tool ever for worship in our everyday life, and that is the Word of God. We have a place of prayer where we call upon God and we seek the will of God, and that is true worship. Moses said, God... I tried it once on my own, and it fell flat. And so, if you're not in this thing with me, leading the nation of Israel, I don't want to be involved in it. And God, if you don't move, I'm not going to move either. That's why God gave them a cloud by day and a fire by night, because Moses said, God, I'm in this thing with you, and I need you to reveal yourself. When you move, I will move. But when you stay, I'm going to stay. How many of us in our life, we call ourselves worshipers, but how many of us really look for God to lead our life? God, if you move, I'm going to go on that. But if you stay, I'm staying. Because Moses was a real worshiper. Worship, yes, I believe that worship is a learning process, and Moses had to learn. And worship is a learning process for us. We live in a world, and I've used this a lot uh, over the past few weeks, but it's the best way I can describe it, where there is such a seeker-sensitive church that everybody wants to go by their own agenda and yet feel like they're right with God. Everybody wants to feel like they're a worshiper but do their own thing. But real worship isn't about doing our own thing. Real worship is about doing God's thing. God, what do you want? I want to be a real worshiper. A real worshiper doesn't just lift their hands up on Sunday morning, but a real worshiper seeks God in every area of their life and is led by God daily in all their activities. So they live their life by the Word of God, whether in secret or whether publicly, they do it all to please God that it may bring God the glory. And they seek God's advice on every area of their life. You know what I found is the best way to seek God about being a good pastor, about being a good Christian, about being a good husband, about being a good dad, really is getting to the root of God's word and finding out how God wants me to do it. Because I'm worshiping God by the way that my life is lived. Page number three. We need to ask God to reveal to reveal the idols of our lives. We may not like the answers, but we need to know. Let's get rid of all the idols and make God number one. He is waiting for us to make the move. He wants to have fellowship with us. Now I just want you to think here. 
I think we're a great church, an awesome church. Let me say this. I meant to say this on Sunday night, but I forgot. But last Sunday night, we had some visitors here. They go to another church. They've gone for 27 years. But they had drove by the area. And they saw our church and felt compelled to visit. Now, we want them to come back anytime they want. I don't love to build my church by proselyting other church people. I will not. I have not. And I will not ever, ever, ever do that. Anyone can try to pull one's way, and I'm not going to go there. Who they want for America or about the church, I will never do that to another church. Period. Oh, That's not how I operate. I'm out to see souls touched for the kingdom of God. So these folks were visiting, and they said that uh, they went somewhere, but they felt the compelling, and they said that that's just what they needed. They needed that service and the presence of God. They looked us up, they found us, they reached out to us to thank us for the service and what God did for them. And they said to uh, my wife and I repeatedly how they felt so loved and welcomed in our church and what great people we have. Kudos, kudos, America Bible Church to you. That's a great mark. That's a great place to be. So thank you for that. That made me very proud. Very proud pastor mark. I can have those, right? And those are good things. But to make us even a better church is to be real worshipers. I'm not just talking about feeling the freedom of lifting our hands in church. I don't want people to lift their hands. But I want them to be holy hands. I mean, we don't want to just let anybody uh, come in and, 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 and just worship and take it. Anybody can worship. Let me just erase that. I want people to come in and worship. But I don't want to be on a surface seat that I'm here for 45 minutes to an hour and I'm worshiping and it's left in the pew. That's not worship. Real worship is when we come together but when we leave. And we keep God first priority above everything else in our life. What is the first thing we think about when we wake up in the morning? I ask you, is God involved in that equation? What is the first thing that we think about when something doesn't go as we projected the day of plans to go? What is the first thing we think about? What is the first thing we think about when we have free time? When we don't have an agenda that's scheduled for us, work, study, family life responsibility. What, what, what is that that we... Because I think that the answer should be for all of us. God. Not looking for our cell phones to find out the weather or to click on Facebook to find out the latest information. This is challenging, too. We live in a world of social media. Do we spend more time with God or do we spend more time on social media? It's very interesting because that's just the generation that we're living in. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with social media. I'm just saying our time, our priority, what we put into our relationship with God when things go wrong, are we thinking that God's forsaken us? Are we angry with God? Do we look for our own resources to fix the situation, to remedy it? Or do we look to God? In our lives, whether it's our life professionally, whether it's what we do in our leisure, whether it's our marriage or our parents or grandparents or family, what is at the center of all? real worship, a real worshiper, God would be at the center of our life. That's challenging tonight. <clears throat> because real worship is about God and not compromise with anything else. Keeping God at the first part of all of our priorities. It's something we have to do frequently to evaluate. Let me just read down and I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop here because I feel like it makes a transition. 
The word of God says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. We know a lot about God. We know a lot about God. But do we really know God? Know him. Knowing him should be our highest priority. Determine and discipline yourself to have a relationship with God that goes beyond attending church. Talk with him every day. Talk with him every day. Listen to him. Read his word. Know him. Worship him with your entire life. So we know God, but do we really know God? Do we know Him? How is our prayer life? And is it just that we simply take time to give petition, or do we take time to really listen to Him in a place of prayer? I think that's probably for most folks a struggle because we're busy and have something next and there's a time agenda. But to be able to pray and petition, but also be able to be in that place of Gethsemane, each of us when we say, but God, not my will, but God be done. And we listen for what he answers. Thank God for Vice President Mike Pence who said, I listen to God. I admire God. That's showing the world that he's a worshiper. He is a worshiper and that's what's important to him. He worships God because he listens to God as well. To know him by his word, to worship him with our entire life. There's so much more that we're going to talk about and pick up next week. But worship is just way beyond the lifting of our voice. It's way beyond uh, moments at church and services. But it's our entire life and our duty. Which I would like to share something tonight about worship. Sorry, I got a little longer than I thought I should have. What do you all think about worship? What have you learned? Not necessarily tonight, but in your life as a worshiper. Worship is in spirit. No, it's not. It's worshiping in spirit. In spirit and in truth. That means that we're yielded to God 100% and we allow His Spirit to fill the core of us and from the core of us we worship Him. Our very being worships God in our lifestyle, not just in our words, but in our intellect, in our will, in our emotion. Every part worships God. Do you ever meet people that are so intellectual, but they're so intellectual, they've got themselves away from God? They're not a worshiper. So their intellect, they've not been saved. Their intellect has not been changed. Someone else? Yeah. I, I just like to say, you know, before I came here, and when I get angry, I put God down and blame him for everything, and people would tell me, you're going to hell, John. And I go, no, I'm not. I was just a copy this and copy that. And I think that since I came here, I felt God over me, and uh, it straightened me out a lot. And I talk to God for the rain in bed at night. Amen. I have to. Right? Amen. Right. But yeah, you know what? The kids would see me on the street. Kids wouldn't know like me. I was a very arrogant person. I couldn't imagine not liking you. <laughs> That's awesome because it's about God and what God has yes, to say. Yes, it is. And you're right. It becomes because there's there's a transformation in us that no longer it's it those about our will. You know, I'm upset because my will didn't come to, to pass. It, my will, what I wanted, didn't happen. But now it's a surrender of saying, God, it's really not about my will, but it's about your will. Yeah, my way helped me out a lot too. But... Amen. 
praying for them and praying for them. Want me to come to church? No, I ain't going to no. But I'm praise God. trying to get with I kept my faith that God was going to talk to him and he did. Amen. Well, we love you guys. We're blessed. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Because God's working in all of us. Yeah. I'm not where I will never be where I need to be told I'm in eternity and I'm perfect in him. But we get in the word of God every day. It's about surrendering our will to him. And it can it can be frustrating when we don't live our life in worship. You know, I'm just saying, Elaine, you know, God, even in your cancer, we want to be glorified for you, even though the chemo and all the pain and all that. But it wasn't about your will, it's about his will. And your testimony, as you say, God has helped me. God has helped me. Someone else tonight. Well, I'll even throw this out. I'm, it might be a little off from what we're talking about, but still when we look at the model prayer of Jesus, it begins with praise and ends with praise. It keeps our focus on God because even in our prayer life, it's easy to get focused and wrapped up. Oh, God saved so-and-so. God saved so-and-so. Or God, you got to move in my bills. you got to pay my bills. I don't know how it's going to be done. Or God, you got to provide food. Yada, 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 yada. The list goes on and on. But when we begin with God, we are placing our trust in Him and we're getting our mind focused on Him. When we conclude in prayer, we are resting assured that this is where my faith is lying. This is where I know it's going to come through with. God is the only one that can do this. And even though all my trials might be a million miles long, I know because of who God is and who He is and what His Word says that it will be taken care of. That He is at my Father and that His Word is truth. And He's already taken care of all our needs. What he says in his word is true. Talk, talking about petitions of, if he clothe the field, how much more will he take care of the, us? If he clothe the lilies of the field, how much more will he provide for our needs? You know, the list goes on and on. But it gets our mindset focused on God in the very beginning. Because if not, we're going to be concentrated on us. And we're going to be fixated on us. And we're going to be worried and stressed. And we get forget on who we're re praying to and who we're going to rely on. So we start by focusing on God. And by praising God in the end, we are concluding as long as saying, well, I know who my faith resides in.